Welcome back everyone. In this video, we're gonna talk about the method of trigonometric substitution and how it can help us evaluate our integrals. And we're gonna start by looking at uh, this motivating example. So in our first example, we are asked to evaluate the definite integral from zero to one of the function, the square root of one minus x squared. We are gonna use trigonometric substitution to evaluate this integral algebraically, but first let's go ahead and do it uh, graphically. And so if we think about the function we are integrating, the square root of one minus x squared, we can also write that as y is equal to the square root of one minus x squared. And we might recognize the shape of this equation already, or we might need to manipulate it a little bit further. If we square both sides and move things around, we should eventually be able to write this as x squared plus y squared is equal to one. And now we should recognize that as our unit circle. But our integral is not describing the entire unit circle or the entire area inside of our unit circle. If we look at it, well, we have y is equal to the positive square root of one minus x squared. So that's describing the top half of our unit circle, but it's only for the x values between zero and one. So it's really just describing this quarter piece of our unit circle. And so we know the area of a circle is given by pi r squared our radius r here is equal to one. So the entire unit circle has an area of pi, but we don't have the entire unit circle in this example. We have a quarter of our unit circle, and well, what's a quarter of pi, but pi over four. So just interpreting our definite integral geometrically as finding the area underneath our curve and recognizing that area is the quarter of our unit circle, we know what our answer is gonna be. It's gonna be pi over four. And so now I would like us to verify this result. We should get pi over four out of this integral when we do it algebraically using trigonometric substitution. So there's lots of connections between our trig functions, our circle and its equation, and all those connections when put together are gonna to help us develop this technique of trigonometric substitution. So you may recall that the way we derive the formula or the equation for our unit circle is using the distance formula. And the distance formula itself is an application of the Pythagorean theorem. And another useful application of the Pythagorean theorem related to our trig functions was the Pythagorean identity that it generated for us. Remember the Pythagorean identity, or at least one of them for our trig functions was sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta is always equal to one. And so this Pythagorean identity, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, as well as the other two versions of our Pythagorean identity are really gonna be the keys behind this method of trigonometric substitution. And so the way we're gonna have the Pythagorean identities help us in this example, as well as in our other examples, is recognizing that our integrand, the function we are trying to integrate, actually resembles this identity. It may take some manipulation to see that connection between our integrand and our Pythagorean identity, but that connection is gonna be the key to making progress towards evaluating our integral algebraically. And so what we wanna do next in order to use the Pythagorean identity to help us with our integral up here is try to maybe rewrite the Pythagorean identity so that it resembles the integrand function, the square root of one minus x squared. Well, we have a one on one side of our trig identity here. And then in our integrand, we have that one minus some quantity squared. All right, so let's go ahead and start manipulating our identity to make it look more like our integrand. And so to make our trig identity look closer to our integrand, we can just subtract one of these squared trig functions from each side. Here I went ahead and went with sine. Um, we'll talk about what would happen if we subtracted cosine squared instead in a minute. But if we do subtract sine squared from each side of our Pythagorean identity, then we can rewrite it as cosine squared of theta is equal to one minus sine squared of theta. And so now we can think of that one minus sine squared as resembling our one minus x squared underneath our square root. But we do have that square root, so let's go ahead and get that in the mix as well. And so, well, to really make our Pythagorean identity look almost exactly like our integrand, we just have to take the square root of each side. Well, what happens when we take the square root of cosine squared of theta, ignoring like absolute value signs and things like that, we just get cosine of theta. And so cosine of theta is now gonna be equivalent to the square root of one minus sine squared of theta. And so how's that gonna help us with our integral? Well, according to our scratch work down here, we can replace the square root of one minus x squared, a function we do not know how to integrate with something much simpler 
the quantity 1 minus sine squared, but then that quantity, according to this manipulated version of our Pythagorean identity, can be rewritten as just cosine of theta. And we do know how to integrate cosine of theta. But our integral is not just going to be the antiderivative of cosine of theta because we still have our differential of x involved. And so what we want to do next is to really force this quantity to show up in our integral. And the only way that's going to happen is if x itself was equal to sine of theta. So that's going to be our substitution. We're going to set x equal to sine of theta. And these trigonometric substitutions are also sometimes referred to as inverse substitutions because if we think about the first set of substitutions we were making, those u substitutions, we we're always setting our new variable u in terms of some expression of our old variable, usually x. Well, for these trig substitutions and all these inverse substitutions, we're doing the inverse of that. We're setting our old variable equal to some function or expression of our new variable, in this case, theta. And so we know what each x inside of our integrand is going to be replaced with. It's going to be replaced with the expression sine of theta. So that'll help us take care of the square root of 1 minus x squared in our integrand. We have to also translate the differential of x into the differential of our new variable, which is going to be theta. So how do we find the relationship between the differential of x and the differential of theta? Well, we just take our substituting equation here, x equals sine of theta, and we differentiate it with respect to theta. So if we take the derivative of x with respect to theta, we get dx d theta, the derivative of x with respect to theta. And we have to do the same thing to the right-hand side. Differentiating the right-hand side with respect to theta gives us the derivative of sine of theta, which is going to be cosine of theta. And so now we could also multiply both sides by that differential of theta to see that the differential of x or dx can be expressed now as cosine of theta d theta. So now we know how to take care of the integrand function, the square root of 1 minus x squared, as well as the differential of x. The last thing we have to worry about is these limits of integration, right? These are x values, but after the substitution, we're going to rewrite our integral in terms of our new variable theta. So our limits of integration are going to have to be those corresponding theta values. We'll worry about that in a second. Let's write down the pieces that we do have. So the square root of 1 minus x squared is going to become the square root of 1 minus sine squared of theta. And then the differential of x is going to be given by cosine of theta times d theta. And so the last thing we have to do to finish writing our integral in terms of theta is translate those limits of integration from x values now to theta values. This step can be skipped when we're working with a definite integral if we take the time at the very end to rewrite everything in terms of our original variable x. But if we take the time now to change our limits of integration, we won't have to do as much back substitution later on. So we find our new limits of integration using the same technique as we did for u substitution. We plug our old limits of integration into our substituting equation, but it's going to be a little bit more complicated now because now we're going to have to actually solve for something instead of just evaluate something. So our upper limit of integration was the x value of 1. If we plug that into our substituting equation, then we get the equation that says 1 is equal to sine of theta. And so now to finish finding our upper limit of integration, we just have to solve this equation for theta. And we can do that by using sine inverse or just remembering the unit circle. So when is sine of theta equal to 1? Well, that's when theta is equal to pi over 2. So our upper limit of integration is going to be now pi over 2. That's our theta value corresponding to that original upper limit of integration x value of 1. And we have to repeat this process for our lower limit of integration. Now we plug our x value of 0 into our substituting equation. And now we solve when is sine of theta equal to 0. And that occurs when theta is equal to 0. All right, so we have finished expressing our integral in terms of this new variable theta. And so now we need to try to evaluate it. But before we actually try to find this antiderivative to help us evaluate it, we need to do a little bit more rewriting. In particular, we have this quantity, the square root of 1 minus sine squared showing up. And what we can recognize is that the square root of 1 minus sine squared 
is the same as cosine of theta. That's actually kind of the whole point of this trigonometric substitution. We're going to have some complicated uh, root expression involving some quantity minus some variable quantity squared or something like that. And we're going to try to rewrite that using manipulated versions of our trig identities so that, that square root or radical is no longer involved. And that's what we see happening here. After we make this substitution, the 1 minus sine squared becomes a cosine squared, and the square root of cosine squared is just cosine, so that cancels that square root out. And so now we can rewrite our integral. That first factor turns into a second factor of cosine. And so now our integral, still in terms of theta, is the definite integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine squared of theta. And so now we have to remember when we have these even powers of our trig functions and we're trying to integrate them, we're going to have to use those double angle identities or half angle formulas. And so the two trig identities that we end up using often in these problems are our power reducing formulas for cosine squared and sine squared. I think I might refer to these as the half angle or double angle formulas. They're all related and pretty much the same. But in this problem in particular, we're going to need to use the fact that we can express cosine squared of theta as 1 plus cosine of 2 theta, all divided by 2. So going from here to here, we just used another trig identity. We used our identity that said cosine squared of theta is equivalent to 1 plus cosine of 2 theta all over 2. And now we're finally in a spot or a position where we can evaluate our integral. To help us do so, we might first bring out that factor of 1 half, since it is a constant factor in each term inside of our integral. And then we have the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of just 1 plus cosine of 2 theta d theta. And well now we can find our antiderivative term by term. The antiderivative of 1 with respect to theta is theta itself. And we might need to use a little u substitution off to the side to find the antiderivative of cosine of 2 theta. If you take the time to do that, you should find that the antiderivative of cosine of 2 theta is going to be sine of 2 theta divided by 2. And so to finish this problem off, we have to now evaluate our antiderivative at our upper limit of integration as well as at our lower limit of integration and then take the difference between those two values. Well, what do we get when we plug in pi over 2 into our antiderivative? Well, theta just takes on the value of pi over 2 and then we get sine of pi. The sine of pi is 0, so we just get 1 half times the quantity pi over 2. And then we have to subtract away from that our same antiderivative, but now evaluated at the theta value of 0. Well, if we plug theta equals 0 into any of these pieces, they all come up 0. So nothing gets really contributed from that lower limit of integration. And so what is our answer? Well, 1 half of pi over 2 is pi over 4. And remember, when we first started this problem, we recognized that geometrically, this is just the area of the quarter of our unit circle, and that area is exactly pi over 4. So this matches the geometric result that we started with. And so this is our first example of using a trigonometric substitution to help us evaluate one of our integrals. We'll look at some other examples in some of our other videos, but what all these are going to have in common is we're going to have some expression inside of our integrand, usually involving some root function. And if we manipulate that using a Pythagorean identity, we're going to be able to eliminate that root function, although the integrals are still not going to be necessarily easy to evaluate, but they will be doable. Already we see how we can find part of the area of a circle using trigonometric substitution. We looked at a simple part, just a quarter of the circle, but if we change these original limits of integration, mess with those x values a little bit, we can start getting different and weird pieces of a circle, areas that we can never find uh, before using our area of a circle formula. So one final note about this uh, example is when we were manipulating our trigonometric identity to make it resemble our integrand, I kind of made this arbitrary choice of subtracting sine squared from each side. I could have also decided to subtract cosine squared from each side. And if we did that, all of our work would be very similar and we'd work out to get the exact same answer. If we did decide to subtract cosine squared from each side instead, then down here we'd eventually set x equal to cosine of theta instead of setting x equal to sine of theta. And then when we found the differential of x in terms of the differential of theta, we'd have to differentiate cosine and that would give us a negative sine. And basically the reason why we're going to stick with like these sine substitutions 
instead of something like a cosine substitution is just so that we don't have to keep track of that negative sign. If you don't mind keeping track of that negative sign, you can use a cosine substitution. It's actually a good thing to practice. See if you make a cosine substitution and keep track of that negative sign, will you get the same answer? If you did it correctly, you should.